Today, by the grace of God, I want to show you the second technology. There are more to show, but these are the two the Lord will have me emphasize. And today we'll be talking about the technology of faith. On the path of spiritual progress, if you are going to ever apprehend God, if you are going to ever seek him, to know him, and to submit to him, you must be one who understands what faith is and how to wield that weapon of faith. So by the grace of God, as God will permit me tonight, we'll try to unpack it so that you understand what the expectations of faith are or what faith is. Because you see, there's a sad, sad, sad situation in the body of Christ. There are many words we use. There are many things we talk about that if you were to meet the average believer on the road, the believer does not even know what they mean. For instance, if I were to go around the room now and ask you, what is the kingdom? What is the kingdom? For instance, because if you are a student of the Bible, you will know that what Jesus preached is the kingdom. Some of the things that you hear your preachers announcing every day in church is not part of Jesus' gospel. What Jesus preached is the kingdom. And is in the Bible. The Bible says that after he healed, he, he, he preached, he taught, he now began. The Bible says after then he began to preach saying, repent for what? The kingdom of God is at hand. What Jesus preached is the kingdom. In fact, when they came to meet him and said, teach us how to pray. The first lines of his prayer were about what? The kingdom. So on the heart of God, the priority on the heart of God is the kingdom. I've taught you before, you are not as important to God as his kingdom. His kingdom is more important to him than you. You. His kingdom. You become important to him when you begin to align with the kingdom. His kingdom. But if I were to ask a Christian on the road, what is the kingdom? The Christian might not even know. What is righteousness? What is grace? And these are the things we throw around every day, every day. You say, how are you doing? I'm well by the grace of God. What exactly is the grace of God? So that dilemma exists when we begin to talk about faith. The average believer thinks that faith is something you use to get things from God. That is his only definition of faith. Something you use to get things from God. But if you are a student of the Bible, you will know that faith is used in many contexts in the scripture. For instance, faith represents our body of belief. What did I say? Body of belief. So when you hear Jude say, contend earnestly for the what? Faith. He's not saying contest earnestly for believing and receiving. He's saying contest, and contend, sorry, earnestly for the things that have been handed over to you, our belief system, the body of our beliefs. But tonight, I don't want to talk about our body of beliefs. I want to talk about that thing called faith that aids you on your journey as you seek to pursue God. And we trust Jesus that we'll come to a point where we'll pray. So we begin first. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now what does this mean? It says that what faith does is that faith gives substance to the reality of substances that are hoped for. It gives substance to the reality of the substance that you hope for. Now, what do I mean? When I say it gives substance, it gives form. It makes it real. It makes it accessible. Something that originally you cannot see and access. Are you here? Because when you start talking about hope, anytime the Bible speaks about hope, it speaks about things that are unseen. Are we together? Yes, Stay with me. I want, to, I, want to, I want to teach tonight. God help me. The way the atmosphere is open, I'm tempted to prophesy. 
but I will try to teach. Romans 8, 24, 25. Romans 8, 24, 25. Anytime the Bible speaks about hope, it speaks about things that are what? Unseen. Are we together? For we are saved in this hope. But hope that is what? I, I, are you looking at your Bible? But hope that is seen is not hope. Are we together? For why does one still hope for what he sees? So if you can see anything, you can't hope for it. It already exists. So for you to hope for something, it must be in the realm of what? The unseen. Next verse. But if we hope for what we do not see, what then happens? We eagerly wait for it. How? With perseverance. Now, if you are hope, if indeed what you have is hope, the proof that what you have is hope for something that is not seen is in the way you are waiting. That word waiting there is not standing in one place, is watching. Keeping yourself in preparation that the thing you hope for will surely manifest. Are we together? Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by what? And not by sight. So it means that this thing there, sight, simply means that we walk by what? By faith, we, we do not walk by these things that we can see. Are we together? We walk by faith, not by the things we can see. Next scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 18. You know I like this scripture a lot, 4, 18. Why we do not look at the things which are what? But the things, but are the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. I've told you before, anything that you can see will not last. Anything. Anything that you can see with your physical eyes will not what? Will not last. It does not have longevity. Anything that will outlast you, outlive you, must always exist in the realm of the invisible. So what Paul was teaching us, I like to say Paul wrote Hebrews, even though some people, there is a theological debate. If you've listened to my teaching a couple of times, I've told you I like to go with Paul. I just like to say Paul wrote it. But if you're a Bible student, they say it's not Paul. Some people say it's Paul. Me, I say it's Paul. All right? So, let me say it's Paul tonight. All right? God bless you. Okay? So, what Paul was trying to show us there is that what faith does, that thing called faith, what it does is that it gives substance to a reality that has a substance that cannot be seen. Are we together? So, what faith does is that it makes real. It makes real something that otherwise if you did not have faith would have been unreal and impossible so you will hear somebody like my father in the lord say that faith does not make things easy faith makes things what possible that you have faith does not mean that the progressions and the processes you have to go through you will no longer go through it what it will do is that it will now make what was otherwise unseen what was otherwise you could, not, you could not imagine happening, faith will now create the platform for you to now see the possibility of it existing. So it is the substance of things hoped for. Your question will now be, man of God, so what is that substance that makes real a substance that is invisible? That substance is called the word of God. Are we together? Have you read in scripture before that faith cometh by what? And how does hearing take effect? By the word. This is why when we do Bible study, Bible study is not simply mental education. Are you here? Bible study is not for you to try and educate your mind or fill your mind with knowledge. Bible study is not literally or, let me not say, it's not just, it's not even you trying to educate your spirit. 
Because for your spirit to be educated, it must be educated by the spirit of God. If we had the time, I would have shown you the various words that are used for knowledge in the New Testament. And one of those words that is used for knowledge is the word epignosis. And what epignosis is, is actually revealed knowledge. It's a knowledge that you cannot get because you went to PhD. It's a knowledge you enter into because the Holy Ghost spiritually educated you. So when we come to Bible study, we are not trying to fill our minds. What the average believer does with Bible study, whether in the corporate house or in personal Bible study, is that he's trying to fill his mind with scriptures. That is not how faith comes. Faith comes by epignosis. Where the written word now becomes revealed to you in your spirit. Where it is no longer just a word that was spoken, it is now a living reality in your spirit. I'll give you an example. You remember that centurion that came to Jesus and said, um, Master, my servant is sick. Come and pray for him and I know you'll be healed. What was the centurion's response? He said, no, you don't need to come. I am a man under authority. That kind of knowledge he had to tell Jesus that kind of thing. Because when it was the time of Jarius, you remember Jarius? Whose daughter was dying. That before Jesus got there, they said the daughter had already died. You remember Jarius? When it was the turn of Jarius, Jarius said, I'm not leaving here until you follow me to my house. So if that was popular knowledge, Jarius would have done the same thing that the centurion did. The centurion was operating from a level of faith that was born out of what? Epignosis. So he was saying that I'm a man under authority. I understand how authority and faith are connected. For instance, let me give you a little insight. If you ever see a man who has, who operates in dangerous levels of power, of faith and authority, I show you that he is also a man under authority. One of the ways to activate faith and to make faith powerful is to be under authority. If you are not one that is under authority, faith will be lame, lame in your spirit. It will be impotent. That's what that man was saying. He said, I'm a man under authority. You don't, you don't obey God normally. You, you, God doesn't govern your life and then you want to wield the scepter of faith. It's impossible. It's impossible. So that centurion was operating. He, in his, in his spirit, he knew by epignosis that if Jesus were ever to speak, Jesus didn't need to come to his house. That's the difference between people who are in a miracle service, live in the service, and then somebody is watching from online and is getting their miracle. They are not in the service. But the difference is like the woman with the issue of blood. Are you here? That woman did not have precedence. There was no place that the apostles sat down or Jesus himself sat down and said, anybody that touches me will be healed. How did that woman come into that kind of knowledge? It's epignosis. And that is what you should normally encounter when you do Bible study. The written word should come alive. And when it comes alive, it now generates in your heart substance. And the unseen things that Jesus has spoken about, you, now know, you don't just know that they exist, you now know that they are yours. By epignosis. It was that woman that now revealed to us a dimension of God. Showing us that whether God touches you or you touch God, the, the results are the same. We now know that because a woman entered into a dimension. Her faith was provoked by revelation. Her faith was provoked by an understanding. So when you do Bible study, you must come to the place where you are not just trying to fill your mind with scripture so that if any of the pastors ask you, this Bible study thing we are doing, are you reading? So you say, me? I'm even doing 15, 15 chapters every day. 
So what you have is a, is a head full of knowledge, but a life without revelation. And you see, the scriptures are not powerful because they are written. The scriptures are powerful because they are believed. Mm. And you see, belief, what the Bible is telling us is that for you to have that kind of faith that makes an invisible substance a reality, it gives you a substance of a reality that is invisible. For you to come to that place, your understanding must be open. Give me Luke, Luke 24, 45. Let me show you something. Luke 24, 45. Go to, go to 44. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Are you here? That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning who? Me. Then go to the next verse. Then what did Jesus do? He opened their understanding that they might what? Understand the scripture. So it means that if that spiritual activity had not happened, Everything about the scriptures that Jesus was speaking about, they would have known it, but they would not have understood it. 